Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I think we'll get started. Um, in today's presentation, we will hear from a few farmers in our portfolio. Each farmer will give a brief overview of their operation, and then we will spend the rest of the time on Q&A. So please submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to them at the end. Before we introduce our first farmer, we would like to spend a few minutes going over an investor relations update real quick. First, our REIT equity shares are available again for investment at the updated share price of $730. This was announced on November 1st. We are excited about the share price growth and we look forward to continuing our fundraising momentum through the end of the year. The minimum investment at this new share price is $10,220, which is 14 shares. Second, our official redemption period is open through November 20th. Eligible shareholders have been notified via email, and if you're an eligible shareholder and you have any questions about the paperwork or the process, please feel free to reach out to Donna or I, and we are happy to help you with that. And then finally, we expect to announce if we can pay a dividend in early December, so shareholders stay tuned for an email about any dividend. And then if you're a note holder, you can expect to receive your interest payment in January as usual. Next, we will jump into the farmers for our farmer panel. We will start with Doug Crabtree. He will give an overview of his grain operation and row crop in Montana. So to kick it off, um, I'll hand it over to Doug. Okay, can everyone hear? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I appreciate this opportunity. It's it's uh, great to get to visit with with some of the folks that make what we do possible. Um, Anna and I uh, farm and, and they're starting to ranch here in, in north central Montana. We, we farm on the Canadian border and uh, as far as 20 miles south from there. Um, we, uh, we started in, in 2009, bought a couple sections and farmed part time. And uh, slowly over the years, we've grown that to 20 sections. So we're managing just over 12,000 acres now. It's all dry land. Um, and for those of you not familiar with Montana, that's a very serious statement because it doesn't rain much here in the best of times. And the last couple of years, hardly at all. Um, I, I like to tell people when you're comparing agriculture in the Northern Plains to, to other regions of the country, you just take a zero off. So uh our uh, potential and uh, and revenue are are equivalent to something uh 10 times smaller in the midwest just to give you an idea you know we grow 20 to 30 bushel wheat every other year is typical here uh and the year in between being a a, a non-harvested crop or a fallow um uh we've really uh, you know, we're, we're kind of an outstanding uh, farm compared to what's around us. We, uh, you know, typical crop rotation here is not one. It's just wheat and fallow. And uh, we grow 20 plus crops every year, uh, really hanging our hat on diversity and looking to get into uh, uh, more into livestock and grazing and integrate that into the cropping system as, as you know, just anytime we can inject more diversity, try to look more like nature does, we feel like we're gaining. Um, we also uh, have a couple other programs attached to the farm. Uh, we, we started uh, several years ago an apprentice program where we aim to, uh, to train young folks that are interested in, in getting into organic farming and then uh, assist with incubating them into their own operations or finding space on ours to, to give them a, a stake in, in the ownership. That's still very much a work in progress. Um, this year we launched uh, the uh, Community Supported Stewardship Agriculture Program, which is a, a way we're trying to get interested parties to help uh, join us in the, in the sharing the risk of, of all that we do and uh, and then in turn sharing with them the rewards and the results. So uh, I'd love to talk to you more about that, but uh, I know we have a schedule and uh, look forward to questions. Thank you. Sean, you're next on my screen. So do you wanna introduce yourself? 
Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Hatley, and uh, I'm located with my, my wife, Jennifer, uh, Jenny. Uh, and so in the picture there, you have my father uh, on the left, and then you have myself and Jenny, my wife, and two boys, Eli and Blake, they're 11 and 13. And then you see Lily and Duke, two of the farm dogs. Um, but we're, we're based in a bedroom community um, outside of Charlotte, North Carolina and Stanley County. We're a very um, hilly area, uh, very rocky soil and an abundant water resource, um, both groundwater and um, rivers in our area. We learned about Iroquois through some research, um, looking at different real estate investment trust um, operators in the farmland space. Um, we see much of our nation's farmland um, still, still being in the hands of, of uh, private ownership, um, but we see that trend changing over time, whether it's multinational ownership um, or in the case of uh, real estate investment uh, investments, aggregating a lot of farmland. Um, uh, an old timer in our area told me a long time ago, he said, if you're going to farm, you have to own dirt. And our farm is, um, you know, the house we live in was built by my grandfather. Uh, the farm was started by my great grandparents and it's it's basically a hundred acres um, they used to grow pigs out on pasture and had a number of uh, chicken houses and grandma would sell eggs to the community and to a local hatchery and it, it you know I'm, I'm 43 and so it's it's been a childhood dream of mine to bring the farm back to its glory days because um, so many of the farms in our region and uh, you know they get to build they get turned into houses uh, that's about the most profitable crop in our region these days and so for us teaming up with iroquois there was um a, a very much an alignment in both uh you know approach to health and wellness starting with soil health um to the the uh, capability to expand our farm and so you know the iroquois investment allowed us to acquire 108 acres from my father um, and so we're, we're managing you know about 230 acres um, in our small part of the world. Um, we've had experience with pasture-raised pigs, um, chickens or, or more specifically uh, pasture-raised eggs and duck eggs and you know one of the tenets of uh, our exploits in farming is, is really on the value added space. We can't play the farming game and beat the commodity markets. We can't play at a, at a scale. Um, we have to play at a, a very niche angle and with emphasis on value add. And so recently in July, we were um, given the opportunity to acquire a USDA meat processing facility. And the, the tenant being that, you know, we, we need to be as close to the consumer as possible. And this is a 55 year old business that allowed us to acquire a market that we are slowly integrating with farm operations uh, to, to create that, that demand side of operations. Because uh, another tenant we've learned is you only grow what is already sold. And by virtue of owning a market, uh, it gives us resilience uh, in the face of uncertain times. Is that a good enough start? That's a great start. Thank you, Sean. Right. Um, and Justin, would you please introduce yourself and your firm? I think you're on mute. There you go. Can you all hear, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, wonderful. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Justin Butts. I'm a farmer. I've been farming about eight years. I started farming when I uh, had to retire from the Navy. I became a wounded warrior in uh, 2014. And I really loved being in the military, but I had to retire earlier than I thought I would. And I had always wanted to go into farming. And uh, once I was forced to stop doing what I loved doing, I decided to go on to the next thing that I loved. Um, 
my family didn't own a farm. My grandpa would always tell me about the farm he grew up on in North Carolina. Uh, but I never got to farm growing up. I lived in rural Pennsylvania and I was surrounded by farms, but I, there were no farmers that were like me. And I was always told that like black people didn't farm by a lot of my, by a lot of the other farmers I knew, but mainly their children. And it kind of got to me and I, it was something that was very, I was very passionate about. Um, so after I got out of the Navy, I actually took over a farm. Uh, somebody kind of, uh, leased me their land to buy. They, uh, I had 500 chickens. I was selling eggs to a grocery store. And throughout the year, I had found they did very dishonest about the condition of the farm. And I didn't know because I was a new farmer. It was my first year out of the military. Um, but at the same year, I was a student at the seed farm in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, which was a farm incubator and apprenticeship. And I learned about farming and about organic farming. And I kind of just picked up some skills and ended up getting out of the first farm and uh, going to college. Uh, at the Culinary Institute of America, where I wanted to go since I was a child. Uh, and I got a degree in uh, culinary arts with a specialty in uh, farm-to-table cooking. And uh, throughout that, I, I bought some pigs on the first farm, and I kept the pigs throughout the entire time I was in college. And I actually started a large soap business while I was in culinary school. And all my teachers helped me with, like, my marketing and my research. And they helped me get the business off the ground. So by the time I was out of college, I had, like, a wholesaler and I was selling soap and I had a herd of about 40 pigs. So I had developed experience as a farmer and I had leased land all through college and I had just kind of grown. And then I went to work at Soul Fire Farm, uh, which is a very interesting organization. I enjoyed working there. Uh, you could probably read a lot about them. I worked there for a year. It was a very small farm. They had more of a social justice angle, whereas I had grown up thinking about farming is more like you have to be able to make a profit to farm. Like they're a nonprofit organization. So their goal is not to make money farming. My, but I realized if I want to own a farm, I have to be very profitable. Uh, so I, the next year I went to work at Laughing Earth Farm, which was a 300 acre multi-species organic rotational grazing farm. And I was in a fellowship with Soul Fire. And uh, through that fellowship, I heard about Iroquois Valley and I learned about a farm in my area that was for sale. So this July, I'm very thankful to say I was able to buy a 104 acre farm in uh, Bern, New York. Um, very exciting. And I, right now I have uh, pigs, I have some sheep, I have goats, and I have a small flock of chickens. And eventually uh, I hope to expand that and do more royally chickens, do more sheep, do a few cows and small fruits. Um, I agree with what Sean said about like having to have like a niche with how you sell things. So one thing I do with my pigs is very interesting. I have Coney Coney pigs. It's a, it's the smallest domestic breed of pigs. They only get to be about 300 pounds when they're a big one. So the, and they take 18 months to get that big. So they don't grow very quickly. So what I actually do with the pigs is I will advertise um, like a livestock butchering class. I do a lot of education work because I went to culinary school. I understand how to cut up the pigs. I'm a chef. I understand how to cook them. And I've been farming, so I know how to keep them. So I do animal husbandry classes and livestock butchery classes. And uh, I'll have like 10 people come. They'll, wa they'll watch me butcher a pig. They'll help. They'll get their hands a little dirty. We'll eat the pig from last time. Like I'll make some like pulled pork or something with it. And then I'll keep the pig because I, I, I'm butchering it at home. I can't sell it to anybody. Um, and then I take all the fat because they're lard pigs and I make soap. And I can make $1,000 worth of soap out of one pig once I mix it with the other ingredients. So I make about 2000 off of one Cooney Cooney pig. And then I still keep all the meat and eat it, which is like, I think the neatest thing that I, I've been able to do. Uh, so I definitely want to do more value added and more educational things on my farm. I also work full time as a chef right now at like a local college and I'm transitioning to a catering company. But uh, over the next six years, I hope to finally like get my farm up to the point where I can just farm full time, not work anywhere else. I want to have like a sufficient, like, flock of sheep, have a tractor, have some gardens planted just so I can support myself off the farm and not have to work. But that's over time. And I would like to do some like apprenticeship and incubation because I worked at being on a farm incubator was what allowed me to get the skills to be successful in farming. And eight years later, I have a big farm. So I want to be able to provide other people with the same opportunities that I had. Now, thank you for listening. I hope I didn't go on too long. Not at all. That was a great story. And I think Harold is um, had a few technical problems, but I think he's here. And um, Harold, um, would you like to introduce Janie's farm? You're currently on mute. Let me see if I can. 
And Hi there. Guys. Sorry for the. Sorry for my. Uh, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, I'm just a busy guy. Um, I'm delivered in Michigan today, and I've got one more stop left before the uh, bakery closes. So uh, anyway, um, so I'm Harold Wilkin. Um, I was. Uh, uh, I, guess, I guess I can introduce myself the, uh, this way. Uh, I was a recovering conventional farmer, uh, became organic 17 years ago, uh, never looked back, um, met David Miller through his cousins, the Brockman family. They were the first people uh, that I rented land to go organic from. And then David, uh, came to me and said, I've got this idea of uh, buying land as an investment to transition to organic. So uh, we found 140 acres right across the road from David's small acreage in Danforth, Illinois. And that was the start of Iroquois Valley Farms. And uh, so that was... Uh, that was actually in 2007 was, uh, was the first year that uh, I, uh, that was the first year that I farmed for Iroquois Valley. Then. So uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we, uh, we're now, uh, when we started out, we were a 700 acre conventional farm, transitional organic. Um, we've now grown to about 3,400 acres of certified organic land. Uh, we are uh, somewhere in the neighborhood without getting technical, about 650 acres for Iroquois Valley. Um, my son Ross bought 60 acres of the original 140 that um, Iroquois Valley bought. And then they turned around and took that money and bought what's called the Mary Ellen Farm at Sister Park, Illinois. And um, so we've had a, a very good working relationship with Iroquois Valley. Uh, we, uh, do a three-year rotation, corn, soybeans, and wheat, or small grains. Uh, and then we have cover crops of rye after the corn and uh, clover after the wheat. So uh, that's a, a little bit about our farm. Um, my son, Ross, has now taken over the day-to-day -day management of the farm. Him and my nephew, Tim Vasty, are both tenants for Iroquois Valley Farm as well as I am. And uh, they're the next generation. Over the next three years, we'll be transitioning to where I probably, other than running a truck and a tillage tool, uh, won't have much management of the farm. So that's us. Great, thank you so much, Harold. So as you can see, we have four accomplished farmers here and um, we are going to open up to Q&A. Um, so please put any questions you have. Um, you can submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And the first question we received is for you, Doug. Um, have you considered raising bison? Yes, um, we, we have two problems with, uh, with livestock in general, and that is uh, very little fence and very little water. Um, and bison might solve one of those, but they'd make the other one worse. Uh, uh, you know, b bison were what was intended to be on this land originally, but that was only when it was uh, intact from uh, northern reaches of Canada all the way into Central America, and they're not a species that, that works very well with confinement or containment. 
and uh, I, I I love bison, and I I'm really uh, anxious to see if we can change part of our country to make that more possible. But um, you know, we, we don't have anywhere near the the land mass or or enough to to make that a viable thing, in my view, at this point. Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, as an audience of investors, what do you think that we could be doing to help farmers like you? Um, Doug, why don't you start since you're right there and then we'll go to Sean and um, Justin and Harold for further comments. Well, we're, we're working on, on my best idea with, with Arnie and Claire and, and the team there at Iroquois, but we really have to get a better uh, risk sharing relationship. And by that, I mean, all of the people who can least afford it are taking all the risk. And those are, those are us farmers and uh, we need to shift that. And, you know, whether that's a simple share lease or sharing revenue or somehow when we don't have a crop, we shouldn't have to pay rent. Uh, or anything else. We shouldn't pay for fuel. We shouldn't pay for any of these things. They should all be a portion of what there is, not a fixed payment. And uh, so if, if there's a way that, that investors can help us move to a more equitable system, I, I'm, I don't have the answers, but I'm really anxious to be part of those conversations. Excellent. Thank you. Sean, would you like to add on? Sure. Um, you know, just to build on Doug's comment, um, FSA has a number of, um, or even John Deere Credit have, have a number of, of uh, payment methods or payment cycles based on crop cycles. Um, so uh, I think I could echo Doug's comments there. Um, farming doesn't exist without markets. If, if at the end of the day, going back to Justin's comment, if we can't pay the bills, if we can't drive profits, then there's not a need for the operation. Um, so if the business, you know, whether it's a hair salon or a grocery store or a bank, if it's not providing a value or a product or service that people value, and, and unfortunately, the way we express that value is through currency these days um, or, you know, payments. But if, if we don't have that market, then we don't need to exist and we can't exist. And so we can't promote soil health. We can't promote land conservation goals. We can't promote the ideals that we stand behind because society as a whole no longer values that. They would rather pay their cell phone bill or, or whatever um, versus paying it in the form of high quality food or uh, land stewardship. And so if there's a way that this investment community can not only put their dollars to work in uh, acquisition of land, structuring payments based on uh, the, the, commodity, the, the farm product cycle, um, but if you can actually buy products, so if you can buy Justin soaps, if you can buy grain, or if you can buy flour from the, you know, Janie's meal, um, if we can ship you steaks from my father's cows, um, you know, I mean, that's a direct way that you can extend your investment into farm operations. Um, that now, now it's a, it's a consumer paying that price. So, so now instead of paying to buy Justin's fat off his pig, which you, you may argue, um, is not worth as much as Justin wants you to, um, but you, he can, he can get that retail value in selling his soaps. Um, and that retail value is where the profits exist. I'll get off the soapbox, but USDA provides all these enterprise budgets. And it's interesting that bottom line is not profitability. Bottom line is re return to um, owner, basically. So what if there is a net at the bottom line, then that's your paycheck for the year. You, you can't sustain operations. You can't grow operations sustainably if the bottom line is your paycheck. True. True. Good point. Justin, I'm going to come to you next for your thoughts. Uh, 
Sorry, I, I always forget to unmute. I am terrible at Zoom. <laughs> Would you like me to answer that same question? Um, yes, please. What could you be doing to help farmers like us? Um, well, I would say the biggest thing is just being more, if I hadn't gone to one particular meeting, I would have never heard about Iroquois Valley. And I wouldn't, I probably, I don't think I would have my farm now because my bank was not being very helpful. Um, no, just be, just knowing that you existed made all the difference in me being able to purchase my farm. This was the third time I had tried to purchase a farm. So I just think being more, just out, I don't know how to describe it, but just being out there more so that people know that this product actually, and this company is actually exists. I didn't, I had no idea. I don't know how you could maybe advertise more, maybe like Facebook or, or just, uh, I think also partnering, partnering with groups that are trying to promote uh, people to get into farming. Uh, like I was in uh, the Braving Seeds Fellowship that was started by Soul Fire Farm, where they're kind of like, a, there's like a group of like 10 farmers where they're kind of mentoring us through the year and introducing us to people like Iroquois Valley and, and other groups like that. I think partnering with, with uh, organizations that are teaching people about farming and also kind of helping us at the next step where we're, where we're the incubators. I think that would be the best way to help us because then you would be meeting people that are kind of at that transition phase where they're looking to buy a farm. And that was, it was just very stressful. Was, I tried to buy a farm that first year and as soon, the bank was just not helpful. Uh, and every, every subsequent time, it was very stressful just trying to deal with the bank. But once I had found the Iroquois Valley, it was a very pleasant experience. It was like night and day. Uh, they actually wanted to help me. Uh, whereas the bank was just like, can you meet these requirements? Oh, you meet them, but I don't like how you met them. I don't want to give you the loan. And Iroquois Valley was just very, it was just very flexible and very willing to, to meet me where I was because I was a good candidate to get the house. It was just, I just wasn't a conventional candidate like banks would be used to having. So I think just, yeah, just partnering with places where they are teaching people to farm and kind of getting us started, I think you would, would really be helpful. I hope that was a good answer. That was a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, Harold, would you like to take a, a stab at that? What um, investors can do to help farmers? If Harold can hear us. Yeah, we have a lot of questions. We'll come back to that one. Um, Hello, are uh, you there? Perfect timing, Harold, yes. Okay, so, um, you know, there are more programs now available through the USDA than there used to be, uh, especially for transition. Um, of course, we're a grain farm. We raise grain that has value, um, but it doesn't have the value it needs uh, before it becomes organic. And so, um, so there are programs now that will help with uh, transition, uh, to transition your farm to organic. And uh, Iroquois Valley, I think also has some uh, programs for that too. Um, so I come from a very different place because I was already a conventional farmer and then, you know, transition to a grain, uh, organic grain farm. But um, I think the one thing that I would like to stress is that um, you need to start, like when you're transitioning, start with something very basic that you're familiar with or, or have some expertise in so that you are, um, you know, have the ability to have some repayment power. Um, I always tell people when you're, you know, transitioning to organic, start slow. Uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And, um, you know, um, there's also like for grain farmers, I'm gonna shut this truck off for a while. Uh, for grain farmers, there's also insurance that you can take out. In fact, um, 
it should be a requirement if you're if you have an insurable product that you're selling should be a requirement when you're starting out to have insurance so that you're not um, subject to just like all the risk. And so, um, you know, I'm sorry I wasn't on in the beginning here so I could hear um, two of the other presentations on what they're doing. But um, again, I, I'm a start slow guy. Uh, don't take a lot of risks. Try and get in on something that has some guaranteed income or income that can be insured and then work your way into um, more of a riskier um, investment, higher return. Um, as far as the, uh, what the investors can do for us, um, help in that first uh, 36 months, uh, like maybe no rent or low rent, or maybe even a, like a, a rent that can be culminated after you've reached the organic uh, certification. But, um, but things like that are a possibility. Great, thank you, Harold. Um, the next question is for any of you. I'm curious for each of the farmers, are there any are there many other organic farms around you? What are your conversations like with con conventional farmers nearby? That's a great question because I, I do think some of those conversations are difficult. Um, and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, Doug, I see you shaking your head. Would you like to start? Sure. I, I, I type a little bit of an answer, but I'll try to expand. Um, first, first thing is neighbors are, are a little different concept here. Um, we, we go 40 miles to get to the nearest town. Um, so there are other organic farmers that we consider neighbors, but they may be 50 some miles away. In terms of the immediately adjoining operations, um, we have a range of relationships from curiosity to uh, hostility. <laughs> and I, I think the ones that are open marvel at uh, how much work we do. Um, you know, the way we farm is a lot more effort and, you know, hands on boots on the soil than what is generally practiced here. Uh, it is it is not uncommon at all for a, a father, daughter, son, team to be managing, I'll say in quotes, uh, 20, 30,000 acres. And, you know, they're going to see that land once or maybe twice in, in a year. And obviously with the, the more intense system, we spend a lot more time with, with our resource. Um, so they, uh, I, I bring that up as they just cannot fathom how we farm. And, uh, I think there's also been a lot of skepticism about the market. Um, you know, most most folks thought organic was a, a you know, it's, it, it's an alien concept. So that, you know, this this too will pass kind of thing. Um, you know, as we've as we've stuck it out here for a while and grown, I, I think some of that skepticism is is changing, and uh, they see it may be viable, but still can't imagine doing it themselves. Good answer. And Justin, could I come to you next? And the question was just uh, as a reminder, um, what are your conversations with conventional farmers nearby like? Oh, um, well, that's, that's a very interesting question. I, I actually love like where I live and I find that all of my neighboring farmers are very supportive and very uh, helpful. Um, I, they're, but they're not organic farmers. They're all conventional farmers. Um, I do have some neighbors that are not farmers that own land that want to have like preserves and things like that. And I think land is for farming should stay in farming. I think it should be 
I would rather see it as an organic farm than to be like a wildlife preserve where no one can farm on it anymore. Um, when I worked at like other farms in the past where there was more of a, of like a social justice aim, I would find that they were often people that had gone into farming, but they had started in an urban setting and they were very used to farming in like small lots and community gardens and they're very, uh, yeah, and there's that kind of high density, a lot of people around setting. And when they, when they would move to the country, they were not very comfortable around the surrounding farmers. And I feel like they, they, the, the farmers could pick up on that. I had grown up in rural Pennsylvania, so I'm used to being the only black person anywhere that I go. Um, but I would find that sometimes when you have people that are not used to farming and they're moving into these rural communities, they have, they have preconceived notions that their neighbors don't like them. And then that kind of shows in their behavior and then their neighbors start not liking them. Whereas I like everybody. I, I was also in the Navy. So I just, I'm used to being around all kinds of people. So I find my neighbors come over with their tractors and grade my driveway. I don't, I farm my 104 acres without any motorized equipment. That's kind of part of my thing. I use, I use electric fencing and I rotationally graze my animals. I set up lanes and drive them around like well, walk them places. Um, and that's kind of part of my goal. I don't want to need a machine that I have to worry about breaking or equipment. So I, my relationship with my neighbors, they come over and they help me with things. So it's, it's been very important to me to kind of have that, uh, to just have a very, I think when you're farming, you need to have the other farmers around you be on your side. And be, even if they have drastically different practices than you, I think there's value to be seen in what everyone's doing, whether it's, what you want to do in the future or just seeing things that you don't want to do. But I think maintaining good relationships with your neighbors as a farmer is absolutely uh, like necessary for your success. I couldn't imagine like not, not getting along well with my neighbors because I would be uncomfortable farming here. I'd be worried about what's going, what could happen when I leave the property or if my animals get out, will somebody call me or if, if there are a lot of them are out, will they help me put them up? I don't, I typically don't keep animals that get out in my <laughs> whenever possible, but I just I think neighbors are really important, and I think it's important to do what you can to foster good relationships with them. Like offer to help, you know, even if you don't have big equipment or you don't do the things they do, see what you can do, and they'll often be willing to return the favor when you need it. I think that's just important, and that builds community as well. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And Sean. I would say there's growing curiosity to what we're up to. Um, you know, we're in the land of uh, three crop rotation of corn, beans, uh, wheat. Uh, we're in the land of Roundup. Um, efficiency is king and efficiency is gauged by man hours uh, or machine hours and bushels per acre. And that those are foreign concepts to us on our farm. I mean, we can appreciate them, but they're not the metrics that we go by. Um, you know, markets drive what gets produced. And so in our region, you know, we, we're a, a livestock heavy um, area. So we're, North Carolina is known for pigs, uh, poultry, turkeys. And so a lot of the grain that's grown um, is produced to support those industries. And North Carolina is a net grain importer uh, because we don't grow enough grain to feed all the hogs and poultry that we grow as a state. They're, they're getting to be, I mean, there's, there's a lot of organic land in North Carolina, and especially down east, um, you know, where it's flat and it, it, there's a lot of uh, grain produced. And, and our side of the North Carolina, so from the Piedmonts to the mountains, you'll see a lot more small holding farmers, hobby, hobby farmers that are part of the uh, Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. So this, this is an association that's been around for 40 plus years and it works with over 2,400 farm members. So it drives policy, um, you know, it, it drives the foodie scene and that, you know, I think we're somewhat in, in the middle um, because our, our neighbors, you know, you talk about organic to them and you're hoity-toity, um, too good for the, you know, whatever, the neighborhood. And 
there, there's not this recognition that, you know, wellness starts with what you put in your mouth. I don't, I don't care if you like diet Mountain Dew all the time, you know, your diabetes issue can be cured with food. Um, that's, that's a foreign concept to uh, many of our neighbors. And so when we're, when, when we get home from church and the, and the neighbors walking our pigs down the, the road um, or the neighborhood cop is, you know, monitoring sheep that are in the neighbor's yard. Um, I agree with Justin. It is nice to have friends uh, of the community, but they, they probably think we're a little bit off the radar, uh, off the reservation, or off the radar um, when it comes to being a farmer, so to speak. We don't fit the mold. Thank you so much, Sean. Harold, I think I'm gonna to come to you with a different question. Somebody asked if you could explain um, your transition from conventional to organic. Um, sure. Um, so most of the land that has been farmed in my area, excuse me a second. I apologize. I'll get so most of the land that was farmed in my area has been farmed conventionally for the last 60 years. So that would be heavy fertilizer use, herbicide use. So uh, we start out with soybeans because soybeans will take pretty well any herbicide that's still left over from the farm being conventional for so many years. Uh, then we go to a uh, small grain and then we put the cover crop in the small grain. Actually in January, uh, I like to seed it into about four or five inches of snow. That way it melts and works into the soil and when it warms up in the spring, uh, then it grows. Um, but then by the third year, we uh, we go to our corn crop, which the corn crop on an organic grain farm is the highest uh, income producer um, in the in the rotation. One of the things that I caution organic farmers or new organic farmers is when you do your budgets, you have to do it as a three year. You add up the income and expenses for all three years in a rotation and then divide that by three. You can't look at the corn year, bean year, and the wheat year and do it individually. It has to be uh, a team. It has to be looked at as a system, a cycle of three years. But, um, um, you know, it, it's a simple rotation. Some people like chastise us that are um, doing organic no-till and other practices saying, well, you're no different than conventional, but we are very different than conventional and we can show you the soils. After a five, about five years, the soil takes a big change. Because one of the things you have to understand is, is that for the past 60 years, it's been spoon fed every other year, or every year with fertilizer, with nitrogen. And the, the soil itself is pretty well dead and has not, doesn't have much life in it. But through the years, cover crops, manures, get rid of the salt fertilizers and, and the, uh, the oil-based nitrogens the soil actually transforms into a healthy living soil. And so I'm, I'm guessing that's what they wanted to know about transition. And that's, you know, like a really quick um, version of what we do. Hold that on. was great. Okay. Thank you, Harold. You're welcome. Doug, the next question is for you. Um, could you talk about the conservation buffers you use? Yeah, I, I wish I had pictures because they're worth a thousand words, certainly if I'm the one speaking. 
but uh, uh, we've seeded, uh, you know, we farm in strips and uh, in between every strip of crops, we maintain a, a perennial strip of uh, what we call a conservation strip that's in uh, a diverse mix of grasses, forbs, uh, mostly uh, seeded particularly for pollinator habitat, uh, but they also serve as wildlife corridors and uh, provide trap crops and for, you know, uh, habitat for beneficials. And just every year we see more benefits of this. It's, um, we like to think of it as, as giving nature some space in the midst of, of our crop land. Um, and as I said, the, the longer we're here, the more, the more benefits we see from that. Great. Thank you, Doug. And Justin, this question is for you. Can you talk more about the ways that you're engaging more Black folks in farming? Well, um, I, would, I would say the main thing I do is just try to interact with, well, I, I engage with everyone that's interested in farming. I really a lot of my the stuff that I try to focus on is getting other veterans into, into farming. I, I worked at Soul Fire and that was their main uh, objective is to get like black indigenous and people of color into farming. And I, I'm definitely in support of that, but it's not, it is not like, I would say I'm more veteran focused than I am uh, like focused on a particular race, but I, I also want to encourage everyone to farm. But I do, uh, I would say I, I do try to be an example of like what farm like what, what 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 farming actually can look like i think a lot of uh when i work at some nonprofits, i see a lot of they, they have a lot of donations they have a lot of money coming in and they uh they will paint a picture that is not accurate of what farming looks like in some situations because they have they're not making money from actually farming um so a lot of what i do is when i meet other black people or any honestly anyone that's interested in farming is I invite them to the farm um, and I let them come and experience what farming looks like uh, and I invite I, a lot of like when I'm at work at being a chef or when I'm out at farmers markets or when I'm selling soap when I'm going out and like I, I invite people to the farm I show them pictures of farming I just kind of try to get as many people on the farm as possible to experience what farming is like um, but I don't aim toward one particular race or, or another, I'm open to getting everyone on a farm because I think we need, I think everyone should be interested in farming because without farms, you don't have food. Eating is an agricultural act like you. If, you, if you're not, there's no farms for your food, you have nothing to eat. And I think it should be, we should be more aware of where our food is coming from, what goes into producing that food. And also from how far away the food has to be kind of shipped to, to get to us. Uh, so I, I do speak a lot to people about like what actually the process is to produce the food that they're eating, um, which I think is very helpful. Just kind of talking about farming with people and being active in the community. Agreed. And good answer. Um, I think uh, farmers are definitely underappreciated by society. Um, and people do forget that without farmers, we, we wouldn't be eating very well or at all. Um, Sean, I have a question for you. Um, it says that Sean said he only grows what is already sold. Is that literal or just knowing that there is a market for when you begin growing the crop or animal? So I would say it's the, the crop or the animal. I've, I've had experience. Uh, so there's a, there's a tenant that says, um, you know, if it's too good to be true, it's most likely untrue. And that plays well in markets. Uh, in, in North Carolina, we've had agriculture markets come and go. Um, they're bust. Um, you know, hemp is my most recent memory where, you know, we, we were growing industrial hemp and we um, had an industrial hemp extraction facility and, you know, that was on the, we, we invested in that and built that because a farmer's co-op of hemp growers were standing there at the farm gate, so to speak, and they had six market contracts dry up or vanish 
or they were they were they were never real and, and maybe it's the 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 type of market or commodity that we were growing which was industrial hemp and there's a lot of grayness around that um but the the point was we built the extraction facility to provide a value add crop to basically provide an, an outlet or a market for the commodity that was sitting in everybody's barn and so it, it is a catch-22 you can't you can't go from zero zero hens to 500 hens oh, yeah. and, oh, you and know, have, I'm not really sure. have customers lined up to buy all of your eggs um likewise i i can't spend 18 to 20 months growing pigs that start off as either sows or feeder pigs and know that I'm going to sell all of that meat weight. And so, you know, our, our experience has been working in farmer co-ops. Um, you know, I was the secretary for our hog co-op for six years and it was the largest farmer owned co-op that supplied whole foods before they were acquired by Amazon. And, and so I, I've seen firsthand the challenges because you, you as a as a on the grower side you spend a significant amount of energy and money and effort to get a product that you can sell to a market well that market better exist to inform what you need to be growing and investing because if you're not controlling your cost from day one then you're going to end up at the gate with a product that's too expensive to sell and nobody wants to buy it um so i don't know if i answered the question but you, you have to understand what the market will bear, what it's willing to pay, what it assigns value to, and how much they can buy. And all of that has to be known before you start growing the first thing. That answers the question, I think. Very good. Thank you. Um, the next question is about conservation easements. Do any of you have a conservation easement on your farm? We do not, but I'd love to. <laughs> I have explored it um, with uh, Three Rivers Land Trust in, in our region. And um, I, I guess two observations in that process. Um, you know, we worked great with them, got our uh, appraisals. Um, we, we have appraisals based on the conservation value. Um, they're, you know, it's a pretty hairy um, easement contract in terms of accessibility, um, you know, for the public good and all. And so, you know, one side, private property rights, um, you know, have, have a certain position that may be antagonistic to the easement language in, in the agreement. Um, on the economic side, as a land preservationist, you know, there's something quite appealing to, um, you know, having land stay at, in its current state as farmland in, in perpetuity. Um, there's also an attractive economic uh, component if they're able to buy that right uh, to keep it in, in preservation. Um, so I, I see the pros and cons uh, with them as a tool. Our experience around here is there's very little money uh, available to um, acquire farmland to put in easements. They're really looking for private land ownership to contribute land in exchange for uh, an appraised value of the easement. Excellent, thank you. Um, this question is for all of you or each of you. Um, I would like to know from each farmer, what is the biggest challenge has been and what are the, your biggest challenges going forward? What is their forward looking goal? So ch past challenges, challenges going forward and forward looking goal. Um, anybody like to start? I'd say it's always operating capital because growth consumes more capital. Um, the The more you grow, the more you sell, the more you, more cash you tie up in in inventory, work in progress, finished goods, marketing. You know the the beast, the appetite of the beast grows. And, and if you happen to know of a market that has a significant appetite, then you have to identify. Um, I would say capital that's aligned with the bigger purpose. Um, it, it's not a it's not a long shark. It, it's not um, quick money. Like I've I've had partners in the past, and they they have a trader mindset. And this what this is what excites me about Iroquois Valley as a REIT 
versus an acre trader as a REIT because there's a long game, I believe, with Iroquois Valley. I mean, anytime you're talking about soil health, you're playing a long game. Um, there, there's a lot of REITs that are out there and they are about investor return but they're subject to flip those assets to generate that return to keep up with their commitments to the investor pool. And, and that's, that's scary as hell because as a, as a farmer who uh, we have roots in our land and, and that's unique um, for a lot of people, uh, maybe not on this call, but for a lot of people having roots in one place that, you know, goes back multi-generations, that's somewhat unique. Well, you know, we're trying to implement a plan that's forward look 50 years. Well, what's what's the predominant land use pattern in our area 50 years from now? Um, if I'm going to survive the development patterns, then what kind of capital, you know, whether it's, it's operating capital, whether it's an operating line to be able to support that growth? Sorry, a long winded. Nope. Good answer, though. Um, Harold, could I come to you next? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, some of the challenges in the past have been uh, some marketing um, instability, but uh, you know that it's one of those things that takes care of itself. Um, uh, you know, um, I used to have a lot of peer pressure um, from other farmers when I first started out, but. Uh, after 17 years, I'm not going broke anymore. Um, and, um, you know, in the future, um, I think uh, government regulation is going to be uh, a problem. And when I say a problem, um, I see some things happening that are telling me that the government's going to want to tell me exactly how I'm going to farm and what I'm going to farm. And that scares me more than anything. So uh, I'm, uh, I guess I'm keeping my eyes open, but I think government intervention is going to be an issue in the future. Perfect. Thank you. Justin. Um, thank you. I, I would agree. I, with, uh, what, ha or how just said, I do, I do see what happens, what's been happening in some other countries with farming. And I do grow very concerned about where we might be going in the future with kind of being told what we can farm and how we can farm it or how many cows we can have. Um, I, I, I faced, I had uh, similar issues when I first started farming in Pennsylvania, I had like a 10 acre farm. And they were, when I first started getting pigs, um, it was, it was grandfathered in as a farm. But uh, they, when I first got the pigs, they were starting to say I, I had too many pigs. They only wanted like, th like three pigs in total. They, they had like a number on the amount of pigs and it wasn't based on the amount of land that you had, which I was saying was completely ridiculous. Uh, and it also depends on your management practice for keeping the pigs. Um, uh, but I would say that that was so just the local municipality not understanding what farming was. Um, I do go to the farm board meetings uh, here in my town. And it is interesting to listen because they, at one meeting, they said, well, we should just ban, ban CAFOs and, uh, you know, could find animal feeding operation. And I haven't gone to like culinary school and learning about CAFOs. And when I had those couple pigs in Pennsylvania, I only had like five pigs, but they, in Pennsylvania where I was from, they tried to say I had a CAFO because they were they were in a, they were in a, I had five pigs. I said I had a capo. So now he, I'm here with a hundred acres. And one of the people on the farm board, who's a nice lady, she's in her sixties, but she, she owns the preserve across the street. And she's like, we should just ban capos. And I'm like, whoa, They're, they expect me to have a certain opinion when they see me come in. And I'm like, I tend to be more, I'm like, no, we shouldn't because one person's definition of what is a capo or what's all right is not necessarily going to match up with somebody else's. So that, that does, I think local governments or just people in general not understanding what farming is and then making decisions about what farmers should be doing uh, very much concerns me. Um, 
and and then just also i'm very fortunate that i found land and i i wish i could have been on the land that my grandfather talked about having especially in north carolina where it's much warmer than it is here um <laughs> i would you know um I, but i i would i would love to have that land where i could have that like family connection but i i didn't and i was i'm thankful that i was able to find a nice piece of land and i think just uh it's a the problem is just finding access to quality pieces of land where you can actually farm is very difficult um there were there were not a lot of farms around this one I only happened to get because someone abandoned it. Someone walked away from a deal they had, and I was I, I'm like, oh, hello, I'm right here. I could I would like a farm, um, but if I, you know, just a matter of timing. And if I if I had been a month later, I wouldn't have known about the farm, and I would still be looking for a farm. So just a- access to land, finding land, and then when you move into these communities or these areas, um, there's there's no stores in my town. Like it is very different. So like just it is it's difficult to like develop a market when you're a lot of times you're moving from an area where you have a market then when you finally get your farm you're moving away from the market that you developed if you're if you're not starting with land that you've grown up on so that that is a problem developing a new market once you actually move on to this new farm you have you basically have to build up i moved two hours away from where i had the wholesaler for my soap so i had to give a lot of that stuff up when i finally got my own farm so that is also an issue Um, Oh, that was helpful. Yes, thank you. And Doug, I know you typed your answer, but it was a good answer. So could you share it with everyone? And then I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up. It's 2.04 Central Time. But we will um, answer the questions that we received um, and didn't get to. Yeah, well, I'd invite anyone, if they have follow-ups, feel free to contact me. I think I put an email in the chat there, but uh, or... Folks at Iroquois can can pass along my Happy contact. Um, by far, the biggest challenge facing us is climate change and its impact on our ability to produce. Um, two years in a row on this farm, we've seeded more pounds than we harvested. Uh, that's climate change, and it's real, and it is the elephant in every room, as far as I'm concerned. Um, As far as goals going forward, we're very keen to identify and implement more diverse enterprises that are not dependent on how many pounds or bushels we grow in a given year to stabilize our our revenue and income and allow us to continue um, stewarding the land in the way, uh, the best way we can uh, without uh, relying uh, entirely on that variable production. Oops, now I did it. I'm on mute. Doug, Justin, Harold, Sean, thank you so much for your time. We know you're really busy and we really appreciate it. And to all the investors who attended, thank you for your great questions and your continued support. If you would like to get in touch with any of the farmers who spoke today, please reach out to Lacey and I. We're happy to um, coordinate that. I hope everybody has a great rest of their Wednesday and uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Bye now. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.